Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like for you to imagine for a moment that you're a part of a, of a huge family. Do you have lots of aunts and uncles and cousins all over the place? Maybe a grandparent or two. And do you have brothers and sisters and kids? Scores of kids, so many kids, you don't even, you don't even know all their names. Then I can imagine that the family is together for a meal, for a feast. Maybe like Thanksgiving. And everyone gets together and, and, and you start to sit down at the table. It's not just one dining table. It's like six or seven tables that are put together. So everyone can have a place. But you notice that everyone, as you sit down, not everyone is there. You, you notice that there are some empty seats at the table. And this begins to bother you. Because this is a family meal. This is a feast for everyone, and not everybody is at the table. There are some who are missing from the feast of the family of God. There are some who are not at the table of the Lord. Now, the church, the church has done a pretty good job of reaching out to the older generation, those with gray hair. Not so much a problem. And the church has done an okay job reaching out to that other generation called baby boomers. Not a bad job there. And the church is actually doing some pretty cool things of reaching children and even youth. But it's that, that strange generation of people who graduate from high school who either go off to college or maybe they enter the workforce, or they go into the military, and for a period of time, they're just searching, wandering. And they're beginning families, and they're, and they're starting out in life, but there's a lot of questions. This age group from 18 to 30 are the ones who are absent by and large from the church. They are the largest unchurched segment of our society. Maybe you um, know pretty well the, the names and the identities given to the different generations. So forgive me for repeating something that you might already understand, but let me refresh your memory. Those born before 1946, there are about, are called the builder generation. How many builders do we have in the church right now? Okay. This, this really is the builder generation. These are the ones who have been responsible for building skyscrapers and buildings and bridges and roads and infrastructure that we have come to rely upon. And they've also built the intangible things, the important things such as family values and commitment to church, commitment to family, commitment to country. That's the builders. The generation that follows them are born from 1946 to 1961, we call them the baby boomers. How many baby boomers do we have? These are the result of the euphoria and the excitement of a new age from those who returned home from World War II. And they caused the largest explosion of population the United States had ever seen. And they grew up with a moniker that said, never trust anyone over 30. And now they are beginning to retire at age 65, which means that they are a confused generation. <laughs> the next group is called Generation X. These people were born from 1961 to 1980. How many Generation X do we have? There is a reason why we call these people Generation X. It's because we don't know what to call them otherwise. <laughs> They are a quieter group, less demonstrative than those boomers that went before them, and fewer in number, and sometimes they're referred to as the forgotten generation. Notice that Disney really failed this generation by 
not putting out any significant movies while they were growing up. Unless, of course, you would describe Escape to Witch Mountain as an epic. <laughs> the next group is called the Millennial Generation. These people were born from 1980 to the new millennium, 2000. How many millennials do we have? The generation that followed them is the I generation. As their name would imply, they've been raised on everything digital. How many I generation do we have in here? These are the ones, moms and dads, that you want to have a close eye on because pretty soon they will have the technology not only to take over your house, but the world. It's no surprise that the shift from any generation to the next is going to cause conflict. We call that a generation gap. A generation gap is the change of the values of one preceding generation that are now challenged by the generation to come. Sometimes the generation gap isn't so much a gap. The little things that have to be overcome by the shifting of those generations. But sometimes that gap is a huge chasm. And there is significant conflict over the changing of those values. Some of you might remember, and maybe even experience now, the knockdown, dragging out fights that you have with parents over the length of your hair, the color of your hair, or the style of clothes that you want to wear to school. The church has had its struggles as the generations have changed as well. I am familiar with um, one pastor. His name is Pastor Isaiah, who really had to struggle with his congregation. He led his congregation for a number of years, 25, 26, 27 years. And he can tell you the story about the time when they were starting out that they had to relocate. They needed to be, well, they were evicted, quite honestly, from their church, and they needed to go into a new place. And so they moved to that new place, and those were really hard years. Pastor Isaiah would say that the harder years are happening now. What seemed to be good news for the church was that they were invited to go back to their original location. And you can imagine people were excited by that, by, by going back to the old time, to the way things used to be. And so while there was some excitement about that, that was quickly squashed when Pastor Isaiah one Sunday preached a sermon, and it didn't go over well. Pastor Isaiah said, there's a new time coming. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They're extinguished, extinguished and quenched like a wick. Oh yeah. Do you remember that? Do you remember when God brought us out of Egypt? Do you remember how he defeated the Egyptian army? Those were the good days. And then Pastor Isaiah preached. Don't remember those things anymore. Or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Pastor Isaiah reminded these people that things were changing. And it's largely because there's a new generation that is rising up. That is going to take responsibility for what the future will be. The story of Isaiah the prophet and the Israelites is a fascinating story. They're on the process of returning back to Jerusalem, the place that they left many years ago, and Isaiah is now promising everything is new. Everything is new. Don't remember the old things. They're not going to sustain us. They're not going to be a part of our future. They're not going to be stuff that we're going to be able to rely upon because God is doing a new thing. A new generation is rising up, and we need to be ready. And the starting time is now, says Isaiah. Had we done a little bit of Bible study this morning and gone back earlier in Isaiah 43, we would have read that God said through Isaiah, Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. God is bringing a new generation, an offspring yet to come. 
In the next chapter, we would have read in Isaiah 44, God says through Isaiah, I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. Well, it's not going to be good news for everyone, is it? This is going to be a point of contention and conflict. Because you've got to hear that older generation say, well, what about us? What about me? Is God going to give me his spirit too? And the friction between the generations begins to heat up. And that's the way it's been ever since, truly. But perhaps it has never been more interesting and more pronounced than it is now with the new generation coming, this millennial generation. Because they look at things so very different. Their experience is far vastly different than the experience that I had. Their approach to life is different. Their understanding of time-honored values that we grew up with are different. The way they look at sex and marriage and work and commitment and family is different. And they've been raised in a chaotic world with a lot of instability. And they themselves now are rather unstable. And perhaps no more place do they struggle with than the church. They do not look to the church necessarily as an organization that can be trusted. Authors such as Dan Kimball, who wrote, They Like Jesus, But Not the Church, and Dave Kinnaman, who wrote, Unchristian, state that the millennials are very critical of what the church has done and what it stands for. Here is what Kimball and Kinnaman say that the millennials struggle with in regards to the church. They believe that the church is too political, too judgmental, too chauvinistic, too homophobic, too arrogant, and too anti-intellectual. But as Kimball's title would suggest, not all is lost. They haven't given up on everything. Jesus. The center of God's saving story holds a particular fascination for them. Because for them, Jesus reveals the activity of God that is powerful and radical at the same time. But what they don't understand is why doesn't the church look like Jesus? Jesus for the millennials is against injustice, loves the unlovable is an agent for peace, is mystical, not dogmatic, is extremely relational and deeply authentic. For the millennials, the church, if it is to be the body of Christ, needs to look like those things and a lot more as well. It needs to actively fight against injustice, not just around the globe, but within our own community and sometimes within our own home, it needs to be loving. Loving toward everyone. Not just people who look like us, talk like us, and believe like us, but everyone. It needs to advocate for peace rather than to be the place that stirs up conflict. It needs to embrace the mystery of God. It needs to be relational, and it needs to be authentic and real. Well, needless to say that the church that the millennials are calling us to be stands in conflict with some within the church. There are people, many who have written books to respond to the books that you just saw up on the screen a few moments ago who would say that if we were to give the millennials what they want, we would be selling our birthright for a bowl, a bowl of porridge. I'm not so sure that's a fair assessment. Because you see, I grew up like maybe some of you, in that boomer generation during that critical crease between the generations. And I remember times of working in the church in the 1970s and 1980s where I was told that the youth were the drain on the church and that there was no future for the youth in the church. 
I, I remember being distinctly told that the church that I was a part of was not interested in making way for the new ideas that we had, so why not go and start a church on our own? The baby boomers have weathered that storm for the most part. And the church, I think, is better for it. But now it seems to me that God has given us the gift of a new generation. One that is shaking the foundation and asking extremely important questions of us. It seems to me that, that we are on the threshold of a new thing that God wants to do. And if we miss this opportunity, I'm afraid we are missing a divine importance. I seem to recall a guy in the 16th century in Wittenberg, Germany, who also challenged one generation to hear the questions of a new generation. I think we are poised to do that too. But here's the thing. There is always a thing. Here is the thing. The responsibility for what comes next, I think, lays upon the shoulders of the current generation who are leading the church, the builder generation and the bloomer generation. It's up to the older generations to learn to figure out how to listen to this new generation and, and how to respect them and how to love them as well. It's up to the older generation to learn the powerful ministry of mentoring. The question the older generation will be hearing a lot is, who are you mentoring? How are we passing along this faith that we have? But it is happening, and it's happening here as well. Probably there is no greater place where the generation gap is experienced than in worship itself. Millennials may not wish to worship the way that their parents or grandparents have worshipped. And so we might be finding ourselves in a constant flux, asking the question, how shall we worship? But about a year ago, one of the members of our congregation who are part of the Builder congregation and who go to this worship service pulled me aside after worship and said, I need to let you know I do not like that worship service. She said, for me, it's a lot of noise. I've heard that complaint before. It wasn't new. But then she said, however, as long as my grandson comes to this worship service, I'll come to the service with him. Well, God bless that woman. And God bless anyone like her who sacrifice themselves for the sake of generations to come. God bless anyone who opens a place at the table for others to be seated. For God is doing a new thing. And, and I believe the millennials will teach us what that new thing is. And the I generation after them will teach us even further. The question is, will we be listening? Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with those who are near you.